Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Rohan Alexander. Uh, welcome to Toronto Data Workshop. Our guest today is William Yu from the Math Department. Uh, William is an assistant professor in the Math Department of U of T, and his research focuses on algorithmic algorithmic methods for computational biology and medical informatics. Uh, he's a legit statistician, and I, I, there's this quote from. Andrew um, Wiles, who solved Fermat Staff's theorem, and he talks about doing mathematics is like entering a dark mansion. You go into the first room and it's dark, completely dark. You stumble around, bumping into the furniture. Gradually, you learn where each piece of furniture is. After six months or so, you find a light switch, and you turn it on, and suddenly it's all illuminated, and you can see exactly where you were. And then you enter the next dark room. And I really relate to that as someone who, um, deals with data on a daily basis. And so I'm really keen to, to hear from William about his experiences in the math department and data science. Uh, so thank you very much, William. Thank you so much for the introduction. I guess I should start sharing my screen. Uh, let's get that pulled up. Um, oh, uh, there, uh, I am very big. Uh, there we go. Okay, uh, let me, oh, sorry, let me pull up the chat so I can see as people uh, talk. Um, so, as I was mentioning earlier on before we uh, got started, this is going to be a little bit more of an informal talk than uh, a research talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the shape and shaping of genomics data, since that's one of the things I focus on. Um, so I'm a an assistant professor. I'm in uh, my undergrad appointments over at Scarborough, so I'm in computer mathematical sciences there. But I my graduate appointment is here in the math department, and the questions that I'm particularly interested in are related to designing algorithms for computational biology and medical informatics, but really on some other level, what I'm interested in, in is understanding the inherent shape of data, as well as understanding how you can use mathematical techniques to shape it to your liking. And so let's start by talking a little bit in general. Um, so what does data look like? We've had data for thousands and thousands of years since we've started writing stuff down, basically. And so like, you can think of data as, oh, writing things down in a book. But of course, like now that we're in the era of data science and big data or whatever the latest buzzword is, I can't ever keep up, uh, we, our data comes in many different forms. And so, for example, uh, I'm a computational biologist. I like proteins. So this here is uh, F1 ATPase. But of course, that's just a label we put on this collection of atoms. And so there are many different ways of organizing this data. One of them is to think about it as a cloud of atoms of different properties in some 3D space. And so you can get a X-ray crystallography, which is one of the forms of data that computational biologists have traditionally spent a lot of time on. Um, but there are also other kinds of data, including uh, more sequential data. So for example, uh, R, this is RNA. So this is uh, transfer RNA2. Um, this is sequential data. You can sort of see that there is a, uh, if we trace the long here, you can sort of start over here and go along. And you'll notice that this is actually one big long 1D sequence. But it also has some structural information associated with it. So it's simultaneously um, sequential and also structural data that we're seeing uh, here with this kind of thing. And uh, a lot of what I work on is the sort of sequ uh, sequence-based data rather than just atoms in space. But these are different ways of uh, putting it. But, and of course, like if you're in the sort of a more traditional electrical engineering background, you will be very familiar with signal processing. And so maybe like data for you looks like um, a cloud of data points uh, that you've uh, taken as time goes on. Um, but in the era of computers, all this data just looks like a bunch of bits and bytes. Uh, so zeros and ones in some really long computer file that isn't really a format that we as humans uh, can parse. Um, so a lot of times whenever you see data science talks, people will put up like some big image of lots of zeros and ones, bits and bytes. And uh, somehow we'll think of that as, oh, this is what data actually looks like. But I, I really don't like that particular framing of it because that's just one particular structural encoding of data. Uh, it's not necessarily the one that humans uh, understand best. So maybe humans understand books better than a bunch of bits on a, a computer disk. And these are all just different encodings of data. And one of the questions is, how do we transform data from one form? So an image of an extra crystallography to a bunch of bits on a page to a description in a book that you might have to telling you about the oh, well, F1 ATP ACE as a rotational motor. So like, these are the sorts of questions that I really care about. And I care about using math to try to understand 
uh, what kinds of transformations you can do. So uh, let's see, where am I? Ah, there. So there are two major tasks in my mind when it comes to data. One is figuring out the existing shape of the data, uh, existing shape and patterns. So for example, uh, well, this particular signal, uh, people will probably recognize as a sine wave, plus some amount of noise. And somehow, when you take the original data, which is just a bunch of points, and you figure out these two structural features. So this is a very low dimensional feature. Like there is some basic mathematical function and some basic noise, and you add those together, and you get this decomposition of the original data into these um, simpler forms. And so we, uh, this is figuring out the existing structure of your data. So figuring out the existing shape and patterns that are there. So this is obviously one big part of it. And in some ways, this is what we care about whenever we're trying to do any sort of feature extraction during prediction. Like, whenever you're doing a classification task, you're really just trying to extract, oh, well, there's this one bit of data that tells you whether or not some image is a cat. And somehow that's embedded in your data, and you want to extract that. But, of course, then that's a shape that's somehow in your data, but finding it's not so, uh, not so clear. Um, other times, for large amounts of data, you may, might need to reshape it to process it. So I've sort of drawn the sine wave, this noisy sine wave, uh, as an image, but that's not the best format for computers to process it. So um, a computer might take the signal and reprocess it as just some big, long list of um, positions. So uh, here, this might be the... Uh, so if this were some sensor, this might be time, and this might be some measurement. <coughs> Excuse me. But regardless, like, somehow these are all different ways of understanding the same data, and I don't particularly want to privilege one over the other. Instead, all, what I want to say is that each of these forms of data is better for some purpose. If you want to look up at what time you, uh, um, the measurement at a particular time, then maybe this format on the right is better. If you want to understand and uh, build a predictive biological model, maybe this format on the left is better, because that actually gives you some sort of insight into the underlying processes. And so one of the things I work on a lot is uh, data compression. And uh, I like to think of this as a certain kind of reshaping of the data. So you guys are probably familiar with JPEGs. Uh, hopefully you guys have seen those around. And so one of the things JPEGs do is they make use of something called the discrete cosine transform. So the discrete cosine transform is basically a way of taking something data that looks like lists. So uh, a, a list of time, times and measurements, basically, or positions and measurements, and then converting it into a bunch of cosines. Uh, because somehow that captures better the um, structure that we care about. And so it turns out that when you use the discrete cosine transform, you can remove the high frequency components at some different levels of compression. So over here, you might notice that it looks sort of weird on the left side of this image, because this is an image I took off Wikipedia where on the left side, they removed a lot of the high frequencies, whereas on the right, on the right side, they kept most of them. So these are only low frequencies, and this is uh, all frequencies. <coughs> so you're... And so somehow, but you'll notice that even at, oh, uh, come on, uh, even, at even low levels of, uh, at even high levels of compression, the feature that we care about, uh, the feature that we care about that it's a cat is still extractable by human eyes even after we've done this encoding where we've removed a lot of these high frequency components. So somehow using this discrete cosine transform uh, and then keeping only the high frequency, uh, the, that, uh, keeping only the low frequencies still gives us enough information and maintains the shape that this is a cat. Um, and one of the important things is that we are able to transform the data in different ways to make extracting information like this easier or to make processing information like this easier because the discrete cosine transform also allows you to throw away a ton of data and makes it possible to actually transmit these things over the web when we don't all have gigabit internet. Um, cat photos are obviously an important part of the web, and this allows us to send many more of them. Okay, so well, that's a sort of fun general introduction, and well, let me like go through a couple of the topics that I'm going to be sort of discussing in today's talk. So one of them is finding shape in data. So this would be identifying actual patterns in the data. So this is a lot of sort of classical data science machine learning type stuff, or as well as if you go back even further, like the basic task of uh, compression. So you're trying to find repeated structures in data, or find specific uh, structures in data that are useful for some reason or another. And then you're extracting a set of low-dimensional features for something like classification or prediction. 
And so this is all sort of uh, like classico. I don't, classico is the wrong word, but um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what word to call it, but like more of what people think of when they think of like machine learning. Um, on the other hand, there's another big task when it comes to data science, which is how do you process and store and transmit and like organize all this information? And that's somehow a different task. And in some ways, that's us forcing a shape onto the data. So when you put data into a database, you are forcing a shape onto it, which might not have been its original shape in whatever high dimensional space it started in. And this is sort of the task of sort of more traditional computer science data structures, as well as things like random hashing, so taking a point and mapping it to a random number, as well as uh, more modern sketching and streaming uh, techniques, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But the basic idea there is, well, when you're trying to organize data, you don't want, you don't, sometimes you don't care that much about the inherent structure of the data, but instead you just want to have it in a predictable manner. So if you're a librarian, you don't necessarily want to try to figure out, like based on a collection of a million books, like what the real order of the books ought to be. You might just want to like impose some ordering on it, uh, say uh, some sort of card catalog system, so you can know where to find any particular thing. So that's somehow you imposing an order rather than an order naturally arising. But it's, it's obviously some combination of the two, right? Because the order you're imposing is somehow capturing some features of the data that you want, but uh, you're still putting it in some particular order, like if you're uh, organizing it uh, by author versus by subject, those are different orderings you can place on the data, and they have different properties that allow you to do different kinds of analyses later. Okay, uh, so that's the general um, stuff. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about genomics, since that's one of, the, one of the major sources of data I care about. So, what is genomics? So, many of you have heard of genomes, and, uh, well, you can think of a genome as to a first order approximation. I am a mathematician. So, the first order approximation, this is some big long string of ACGs, Ts, um, of about like 3 billion for humans, uh, smaller for uh, other, uh, for bacteria, and like different for different um, organisms. So, this is some big long string of ACGs and Ts, and unfortunately, we are unable to read the entire string at once because it's just too long. So like um, you can't read three billion letters all in one sitting. But well, the techniques we have is we can cut we can cut up uh, the uh, big long string many many times at random. So this is what's called shotgun sequencing, and you end up with uh, come on, oh. you end up with a bunch of little fragments of lists uh, which are of length about say a thousand under a thousand, uh, a bunch of little fragments. And then there are several questions. One is, one of the major ones is though, how do you, how do you piece together the original big long string um, from all these little, oh, wait, what just happened? Go back. Um, how do you, oh, go back there. Yeah, how, how do you figure out the original big long string from all these little uh, pieces? It's sort of like if you took a book, you ripped out all the pages and ripped the pages into pieces um, and then threw it all around. How do you piece them all back together? And that's quite hard, right? Because, well, uh, maybe some of the, uh, well, let's assume that it's a book without page numbers. The page numbers make things too easy. But, so you've, you've cut it up and you're trying to piece together, and if you, the, you only had one copy of the book that you ripped up, well, it's really quite difficult to figure out. But if you have many copies, maybe you can use some amount of overlap. But, uh, also, if you have a copy of, uh, say, the Bible, and uh, that, that's that been ripped up uh, with the slight differences, but you have another existing copy of some like complete copy of the Bible, one of the things you can do is you can take um, the, the pages that you've ripped out and you can try to match them to your existing good copy. And even if there are slight differences, you can still figure out where the rough position of where things ought to be. And so these are the basic tasks of genomics. So with all these little random pieces, uh, the harder task, well, the assembly task, is how do you piece them together without knowing the end picture? And that's actually a really difficult task that people are still working on. My, I think there's some timing thing that's going on that I forgot to take out because it keeps on changing on its own. Um, but the, one of the other tasks is the uh, read mapping task, where if you already know your reference, so if you already have a copy of something that's very similar to the thing you're trying to read, then you can just take each of those pages and figure out where it is on your, um, on your reference, and that allows you to order things together. And, uh, well, one of the common tasks here is then trying to, okay, something is weird and my PowerPoint seems to want to go on its own. But anyway, um, I think I left some animations in there at some point. But anyway, so the point of this is once you've read all the 
uh, read a particular individual's genome, which is going to be different than the human reference, you can figure out how it's different and then do analyses on that. So you can extract features from that to predict things about um, how tall you're going to be or things of that sort. Um, and uh, let's talk about the read mapping problem again. So for read mapping, okay, why is this, sorry, something is wrong and this is animating on its own and it's really disconcerting me. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so for the read mapping problem, let me go back. Uh, the problem is basically, come on, if you start with uh, uh, a particular subsequence uh, here, you want to find all the locations that it maps to, um, and I think that's in the wrong place, but let's put that one back there. I am very sorry. I think I have something in PowerPoint turned on that's causing it to animate itself constantly. But anyway, you're trying to find all the different locations for your query that match in the reference. And in this case, there might be two of them. Um, so I placed these in the wrong place, but that might go there. And often, you're actually interested in a broader question, which is if you're given um, Uh, why is my eraser not working? I am very sorry, but something has gone wrong with... Okay, anyway, hopefully this is all good, and I hope I don't have any... Okay, sorry, I'm a bit flustered now because my PowerPoint is haunted. Um, so... We have the problem where if you have a single source genome and you have a bunch of reads from that, how do you figure out where they go? But often when you're dealing with bacterial genomes, you actually have many different uh, bacteria, let's say, in your gut that all have very similar genomes. And one of the questions is, if you have reads from all these different uh, bacteria, so these are cut off pieces from all these different genomes, how do you simultaneously map all of them uh, over to the, these respective references? And this problem turns out to actually be somewhat harder because many of these different genomes will be similar. And so you have to, sometimes a single read can map to several different locations. Uh, so uh, w are there quick ways of figuring out uh, all different locations that a read uh, maps to? Uh, and so that's one of the major problems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the algorithms that we use, to, that um, people use to solve these, though not in too much detail. And I'm going to try to use this to illustrate some of the facts that, like, that we can, uh, some of the things we can do if we understand the uh, underlying structure of the data. So one of the uh, tasks is, well, if you want to figure out the nearest location in the genome, so if you have a, a bunch of uh, reads, so each of these here is some piece, uh, A, C, G, T, whatever, um, and you, uh, you have some reference. So this is the, all the different locations in your genome. So uh, the, this is one big long string, uh, but you're trying to find, uh, so this might be A, C, G, T, etc. And you're, you're trying to find the uh, matching locations in this reference. So this is the same problem that we were talking about earlier. Um, but it turns out, if you understand this as not just a big long sequential sequence, but you think of this uh, reference as a bunch of points in space, as a collection of a bunch of points uh, in the sort of string space, then you can imagine that you've placed these all in uh, different uh, locations in this high dimensional space. And then when you're finding the best match, all you're looking for is you're looking for whichever point is the closest. Unfortunately, that's things that would be somewhat hard. Uh, one way of figuring out is you can just compare it against every single location. Um, there are fast ways of doing this. Uh, we're not going to go into them. Uh, and that does work. So. You can, uh, uh, oh, sorry. you can find the best location by just looking at all the locations. Uh, sometimes, though, you might want to figure out all of the locations that it's sort of close to, so like every location within some radius in this high-dimensional space. And when you're doing that, though, this is a slightly different problem. So the previous one was the best mapping. You're finding the best location. But here in this problem, we're looking at, uh, at all locations, and so this is uh, called an all mapping. And this is important because if you go back to this slide, um, sometimes these particular uh, reads will map to multiple genomes. And so you want to find all the locations they map to, and not just one of them. And so now, well, uh, what can we do? Well, so you might think, well, if somehow I found one nearby location, then understanding the structure of the side dimensional space, you know that the other locations are also sort of, uh, that should also be close to it if you choose the right space. And so one of the things you can do is you can, if you cluster the original set of data points, um, 
If you cluster the original set of data points, then maybe you don't need to search the entire database because you can search for some close, uh, you can find some nearby location, and then from that, you can just walk along that in your, uh, in some uh, clustered search tree to figure out where you're supposed to go. And it turns out, and I'm not going to go into it but here, but a lot of biological data actually lies on these low-dimensional manifolds. So um, right in here, I've drawn out this thing as like just a bunch of points gathered around in space. But in reality, it looks something a little bit more like uh, this. And so uh, this, is, this is cartoon data. So this isn't real. But somehow the data is uh, clustered and uh, local uh, for many kinds of biological data, which means that uh, you don't actually have to draw that many clusters because they're, um, the data doesn't like, it doesn't, fill the entire high dimensional space. The data is sparse. Uh, but anyway, once you've done that, then what you can do is uh, you just need to find a single hit uh, nearby. So you find some best mapping, so uh, some force mapping. Uh, and then for the find mapping to get all the locations, you just have to walk along both the reads and the reference to find the nearby points. And so this actually speeds things up quite a bit. And there are many different ways of doing this sort of um, faster search. Uh, this is this sort of clustered method is uh, sort of naive, but it does work fairly well, and it's one that we've implemented before in the past. So this is sort of all data structural. So if you've taken computer science, like this is all just, oh, yeah, well, you uh, construct the right search tree, and then uh, it's a lot easier to find the correct points. Oh, yeah, there's a comment in uh, the chat. Yes, yeah, so Voronoi diagram. So basically, you can cluster everything by the nearest uh, point. So this is one of the major problems, and this one is sort of specific to computational biology because of the structure of our data, uh, because we're looking at a big, long string of uh, letters and counting it up into lots of little pieces. But there are other ways of understanding this, which uh, fall a little bit more into more traditional data science. So the mapping problem was, well, for each of our reads here, we wanted to figure out their, uh, where they map to in these different reference genomes. But sometimes you don't need that much information. Sometimes we only need to know, for each of these original reads, which of these genomes they belong to, because that allows us to count how much of different species of bacteria are present. And that may tell you something about the uh, imbalance in the ecology of the human gut or an ocean microbiome or something like that. <coughs> and so for that purpose, uh, that's actually a different problem. So this is the related binning problem. So if you have a bunch of environmental samples and you still have all these different um, uh, read sequences from many different species, Maybe all I want to do now is I just want to color these by which genome they come from. And this turns out to be an easier task, right? Because if you could map them, uh, well, then obviously you would know where they came from because you would know uh, which, uh, which position they mapped to best in the genome. But if all you want to know is where they're from, there are, actual fa there are actually faster methods because you don't need to know quite as much information. There are several different approaches to this metagenomic binning problem. Um, one of them is just to map them. So if you start with a read and you start with these three genomes, then maybe you uh, will try to find the best location. And so this is alignment-based binning. So when you do this, you're able to uh, figure out, oh, well, it maps to this location on this red genome, and so clearly it must be part of that. Um, but this is specific to these sorts of biological sequences. So this sort of sequence-based analysis where you can actually line things up. Another quite popular approach, uh, which makes use of a lot more uh, machine learning-like techniques, I mean, it makes use of machine learning techniques, is to, instead of um, uh, taking the entire read and mapping that location, we're going to find the k-mers in the read. So what's a k-mer? So a k-mer here, uh, I probably should have had a tutorial here, a k-mer here would be a subsequence. So it might be like a, 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 and then you have a, 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 c, a, a, c, c, etc. So these would be the formers. Um, so that would be formers. But k-mers, just uh, often we pick some larger number. But if you look at all the k-mers in a read, Somehow you can use those as features. So if you're more familiar with machine learning terminology, you can think of the presence or absence of a particular k-mer as a feature vector um, about your read that tells you something about the read. And then you can look at the same type of feature vector, so the distribution of these features in the original genomes. So maybe uh, uh, the, in the original genomes, uh, you uh, in this one here, maybe you have AAAA, but, uh, and over here you also have AAAA. But over here, you don't have a, um, it might not be in the same position, though. So for example, maybe the AAAA here is over here. And maybe it just doesn't exist at all in the uh, gray genome. But so the po sort of point is, if you look at all these k-mers from, from your different reads, you can look to see the, fr the fr fraction of those k-mers in your original source genomes. And allows that, that allows you to give, put some sort of probability on whether or not that k-mer came from the black uh, genome or from the red genome. 
Uh, and so uh, this is pretty standard uh, feature-based classification. You can, uh, we used an SVM, but you can use any sort of uh, classification technique you want. And the basic idea is, or you can use a maximum likelihood estimation as well. Those, I think those are a little bit less uh, in vogue right now. Um, but this is uh, uh, sort of compu uh, this is called compositional bidding. So you're taking your original big long string, you're breaking it up into all of its uh, little pieces of size four or size eight or whatever, and then you're using the composition of your read as a feature set. Uh, if you're from a more linguistics background, this is basically doing uh, some sort of bag of words style um, uh, like distance uh, computation. But so you can also estimate uh, which genome it's likely to be from, and I think I meant for leaves to be red in color, but I think I got my colors wrong. Um, sorry, I, I was copying some slides from another template, and so some of my colors got mixed up. Um, but yeah, so these are the different approaches, and this is one of the ways in which uh, these sorts of computational bi uh, biology problems really fit under the sort of general framework of data science, because you can sort of recast these problems with more traditional um, uh, data science methods. But now, if you we're thinking about this as more, more of a machine learning type uh, um, problem, then the one super important question is, how do we pull, uh, pick good features? And here are, we're choosing k-mers as features. So these have traditionally been the workhorse of genomics algorithms. But there's a ton of redundancy when we select all the k-mers, right? Because if you look back here, our first k-mer was AAAA, our next k-mer was AAAC, and then AACC. So somehow, selecting all these features, there's a ton of redundant information involved there. Um, so that brings up a question. Can we subsample the k-mers somehow? Um, Oh, sorry. Can we can we subsample the cameras somehow? Now this is non-trivial because the problem is if you have some sequence A A A A C C C C, um, and you uh, want to subsample them, so maybe you want to take every fourth camera. So then you might say A A A A and C C C C. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the big problems with uh, computational uh, biology and genomics is that we get randomly cut up pieces of these things. So what happens if you get the piece A, 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 let's say, let's, let's say like one ton to T, 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 T. So you got several more. Uh, but what happens if you cut off the first letter? And uh, maybe it ends with a G or something. Then all of a sudden, the formers that you get from that would be A, 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 C, 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 T, and T, 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 G. So there's this problem of translational invariance, uh, which is basically to say, well, unfortunately, you can't just subsample uh, in an uncoordinated fashion because then if you take two different reads, which really should match up because they're identical except on a, a very small subset of locations, you end up with a completely different sample and then you can't compare them. One thing you could do is you could just be like, okay, well, I'm comparing two different things, right? I'm comparing my read to some reference, and so maybe I only subsample on one of them. So maybe I only subsample the read and uh, store all the different cameras in the reference, or maybe I only, sub or only subsample the reference and look at all the cameras on the read. And that does work, but it's still sort of computationally expensive because you're only able to subsample one of your two, uh, one of the two data sets you're comparing when you're doing the sampling. So that brings us to um, uh, ideas of coordinates catching and like. Uh, what I was talking about earlier about shaping the data using, um, using randomness. So what we're going to do is we're going to make use of these things called probabilistic sketching algorithms um, to do a coordinated sampling of our data and to reshape it using uh, the power of random numbers. So basically uh, what a hash function does, uh, do I have this written down anywhere? I don't know if I do. But so a hash function basically takes some element uh, over to say some interval 0, 1 um, randomly. I'm not going to say exactly what this means uh, because that would take a computer science lecture. But the basic idea is we can take each of our um, each of our sequences, we can throw them through a hash function, and somehow that gives us an ordering that allows us to do a coordinated sampling. And the, the reason this works is because somehow the hash functions force the data into a well-defined shape. It doesn't matter what shape the data was to begin with. When you apply this hash function, it it looks like ran it looks like uniform random data. And now you might think, well, that's bad for it to look like uniform random data. That just looks like noise. But it turns out if it's a very tightly controlled what kind of noise we have, then we can say a lot about it. Because then that becomes a problem in probability. And so you're, all you're doing is you're looking at probability distributions and figuring out what goes where. Um, so uh, that was sort of high level. The basic idea here is that these are uh, a family of algorithms called sketching algorithms, which have really started coming to prominence over the last 10 years, though people have been working on them for 20 or 30. Um, and so these are a set of sublinear space algorithms that use hash functions to do coordinated sampling. And uh, the reason they're called sketching algorithms is because you can represent a big data set 
has some small probabilistic data structure that you've used these hash functions to create. They're called a sketch. And you can get fast estimates of some quantity that you care about, say, how big something is, uh, how much things overlap. And these are widely used in, um, say, routers, databases, search, etc., for just quick comparisons of two sets that aren't quite exact because you're doing some sort of sampling, but are fairly fast and reasonably accurate in a controllable way. Uh, and the other big deal about these is that sketches are composable. So what this means is that if you have some data stream that's coming in uh, and you're constantly updating your uh, sketch, so I'm representing that by this little 4 by 4 table here, you're updating the values of your, your sketch as the data comes in, um, once you've done this for one data stream, you can actually compose it with another data, data stream. So, so this is set A. We have some set B that has its own uh, thing. And you can compose these together and get, say, the overlap of sets A and B. And this is precisely what we care about when we're looking at comparing, say, a read to a genome or one genome to another. You want to understand like how much overlap, how much similarity there is between the two sets. And the nice thing is that basically what happens is we get these small representations, these probabilistic sketches, that they're these compressed summaries that still can be computed on to get the quantity that we care about. Uh, I'm going to give one example of this because I don't have time to give a full sketching uh, class. Um, and so um, many of you will be familiar with the Jacquard Index. So this was actually developed by a, uh, a biologist in 1902. So those of you who are machine learners and didn't know that Jacquard Index is actually a biology concept, um, so it was, this was developed actually to uh, measure the um, overlap between alpine ecosystems by, um, I think, Pierre Jacquard back in 1902, uh, way back before any of uh, us were working on uh, th these sorts of things. Oh, sorry, some of my slides, I think I might have, I think there's a tiny bit of water on my iPad, and so like it's occasionally like trigger triggering the next slide button. Anyway. So this measures the similarity between two sets of objects by taking the size of the uh, intersection divided by the size of the union. And now, well, unfortunately, if you want to do this exactly, well, you need to have some party needs to know both all of A and all of B, right? Because in order to figure out the intersection, you need to know that kind of stuff. Luckily, there is a way of using probabilistic sketches to figure this out a lot more quickly, which was done by um, Andre Broder in 1997 in the form of something called MinHash. So some of you who are a little bit older <laughs> may remember Alta Vista. So uh, back in the days, oh, uh, come on, don't go yet. Uh, back in the days before Google, um, there were a bunch of other search engines that people actually used because uh, no one had dominated the search space yet. Alta Vista was one of these various search engines. And one of the problems that you get with search engines is you don't want to see the same page over and over again. So like, if you look online, there are actually a bunch of people who just copied Wikipedia and created a new site based on that. And you don't want all of your search results to be the same page uh, once you, when you search. And so you want to somehow deduplicate uh, web pages on the internet. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you want to somehow deduplicate uh, web pages on the internet. Uh, and but that's a sort of difficult task, right? Because, well, like maybe you can find exact matches. Uh, well, that's easy. You just run it through a hash function. But these sorts of almost matches, like they, maybe they change one or two words because they, maybe it's a slightly different version of a different uh, of Wikipedia or whatever. Um, then exact matches don't work anymore. And so you want to do these sorts of approximate matches. And what Andre Brother figured out is, um, well, and this is sort of in the computational in linguistics field now. I think they've sort of claimed this area. What they figured out is, if you start with a, a web page, you can break it up into lots of little pieces. So uh, what he called shingles, but which I'm going to call kamers because I'm a computational biologist. You break it up into lots of pieces with uh, like three word phrases or something like that. And you look to see whether two web pages have the same set of three word phrases or almost the same set. You want the Jacquard index of their sets of three word phrases to be high um, because that would mean that they're actually the same page and you can throw one of them out. Now, of course, uh, doing this exactly requires a lot of computation and figuring out what the actual matches between the different sets are. But um, you can do something a little bit more clever. So let's think about this as just sets mathematically. You have some set A, and you have some set B. Um, and you have some overlap between the A, A and B sets, which I've represented here in gray. But these are just the items that are in both sets. Now, suppose, for an instance, that I took a random permutation of everything. So I, I suppose I knew the total set of, um, of the total union set of both uh, of Chingos and A and B. And I just take a randomization of it. I'm just going to permute it. <clears throat> So after I do, and I, I'm going to permute this a couple of times, um, and you'll notice after the, I do the permutation, you can look at whatever the leftmost item is. Sometimes the leftmost item will be from set A, sometimes it'll be from set B, sometimes it'll be from both sets. <clears throat> when is the item from both sets? 
Well, uh, the item is from both sets precisely when the item is in your intersection, right? Because uh, this, gray, this gray node here, uh, it's in both sets, and that means that it had to have been in the intersection of both sets to begin with uh, before this permutation happened. And so therefore, because that, the probability of selecting that is just the size of your intersection divide, oh, divided by your entire set, um, you're able to estimate the Jacquard index from these empirical probabilities. Um, basically by redoing this multiple times and seeing how often uh, an item from your intersection pops up. Uh, because that will also be how often the smallest item in your set is both in A and in B. So now another way of doing this is you can first start by taking a uh, hash function instead of a permutation of all of your sets of your set A and of your set B, and then you can just store the minimum hash value for both your set A and your set B. When you do this, uh, the minimum hash values for both sets will be the same precisely when it's the same element. And so the probability that the minimum hash values for these two sets are the same is also your Jacquard index. And of course, a hash function is much easier to store. So those of your computer scientists will recognize that you can store this in O log n bits. Um, actually, for the record, uh, this particular algorithm you can do in O log log n bits, uh, which is a paper that I worked on a little bit ago. Um, but uh, I'm not going to go into details on that. Uh, just like the classic fun function takes O log n bits in order to store these permutations uh, to store these minimum hashes. And so let's work through a quick example of one. Um, so for the set A, let's say that's five items, or five million, or whatever, uh, we take, uh, say, uh, seven different, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, seven different hash, uh, ha hashes of it. You take some, some other set B that has more, 10 items, you take the hashes of it, and then you look to see how often these, value, these uh, hashes are the same for a particular hash function. And that gives you an estimate of the Jacquard index uh, by the, uh, what we just showed a little bit ago, which that basically proves that that gives you an estimate of the Jacquard index. Um, and this allows you to uh, <coughs> uh, quickly figure out the similarity between two web pages. Um, another nice thing about MintHash is that you can actually take the union of these sketches. You can merge them together uh, because uh, you just take the minimum of both, and that gives you the uh, Jacquard in, uh, sorry, the hash of the union of the two sets. So now MintHash allows this uh, coordinated random sampling uh, of items from two sets. And that's precisely what we want here because then that makes it translationally invariant for um, our, pro uh, our purposes um, to some degree. So let let's work through that quickly. So um, I'm not actually going to use MinHash, though so, uh, directly using MinHash like this is actually something computational biologists do also do to quickly measure the similarity between two, two genomes. Um, but that, that's in some sense more of a, uh, so that, that's in some sense applying this to uh, sort of more general data science problems of just like looking at how similar two sets are, maybe you can classify them by uh, how, close the, how close they are together in terms of this MinHash Jacquard index uh, space. But if you remember, and going back, one of the things we cared about, uh, so that's useful for things like the bidding problem, but it's not so useful for things like the alignment problem, where you're trying to find a particular location on your genome. So if you take the entire genome and just turn it into this bag of words, uh, into this bag of k-mers, uh, and apply this sort of thing, you can figure out how close two genomes are to each other, but you can't figure out where on a genome a particular read really lies. Um, but there, and so this is why uh, biologists came up with this uh, idea of minimizers. So these are related to MinHash somehow, though they are independently invented. So I don't, the credit should be given to both inventors. But you can think about minimizers in genomic algorithms as a way of turning these sorts of MinHash-like algorithms and making them local and allowing you to then do uh, database lookups off of them. Uh, so let's suppose we start with the sequence A, A, C, G, G, A, A, T, T, A, A. That's not very random. Uh, anyway, but uh, I was writing this up last line. I was trying to do this sort of semi-random sequence, but it doesn't really matter. So if you look at all a set of k we have quite a few of them, right? And so if you want to store all of these, so that would be an issue. You could just store the minimum hash of all of these, and that would uh, be uh, somewhat less space. But what we're, and so that's actually what we're, we're going to do that, but in a sort of clever way, and doing it on the rolling window. So the first thing is we're going to hash all of these. These are all going to have some value after you apply your hash function. Um, but then the clever thing with minimizers is on a rolling window, you're going to take the minimum uh, of these hash values on each of these windows of, say, five different uh, Cambridge. And one of the things you might notice doing this is that as you do this rolling window, most of the times, or with some high probability, and you can actually compute this using uh, things like Jacquard index, the adjacent windows will have the same minimum. And this makes sense, right? Because if you have some really small number here, um, then it's probably smaller than any number that you're going to have in the next window either. Um, and when you, when you do this, you're able to uh, sort of compress down this big 
uh, set with all these minimizers uh, into, oh sorry, I'm covering up the 15 for 21, but you're able to take this big set of k-mers and compress it down to just a few representative k-mers. Um, or in this particular case, these minimizers. You can throw either the minimum value or you can throw the original camera that it belonged to. And so you're able to do this sort of sampling of the camera space on the sequence in a way that respects location. And so on later, when you're comparing this against the genome, uh, you can then, instead of comparing every camera like you would have had to uh, originally, you can just look at the set of minimizers of your reads, the, the thing you're querying, as well as the minimizers of your database. And so you're able to get compression on both ends as well as make things much faster since you're just doing many, many fewer database lookups. And so this is the power of making uh, use of these hash functions is that you're able to do this sort of data compression in, by reshaping it in this defined way of doing this coordinated random sampling. And there are other things you can do with this as, as well. Uh, so just a few concluding remarks. When dealing with high dimensional data, sometimes we're seeking to extract interesting features. Uh, so this is sort of more standard data science analyses, classifications, predictions, etc. Um, for us, we might be predicting the taxonomic source of a DNA sequence, by which I mean which genome it's from. But other times, we're trying to put the data into a particular format that's easy to work with. And so this is more databases and data structures. And there's actually a lot of interesting probabilistic algorithms you can make use of using hash functions, as well as uh, doing uh, things like more classical, like search trees or for read mapping. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry, I did those points out of order. You can also, you can also use hash functions to force our data into a particular distribution. So you're then able to use, make use of probabilistic techniques to understand after you force the data into some distribution, how to organize things. And uh, with that, I want to quickly acknowledge um, uh, some of the people I've worked with. So the, my advisor uh, and I worked on this for a while and uh, Dennis uh, worked on some of the compressed read mapping stuff with me. Griffin is the person who introduced me to, uh, this was actually when I was a postdoc at Harvard Med School, and we were using these algorithms on doing quick queries on clinical databases. So how many patients have both diabetes and hypertension, that, that sort of question. No, Daniel's worked with me on some of the uh, under, understanding the high dimensional structure of camera space. And Jim Shaw is currently my student here at U of T, and he works with me on understanding, among other things, uh, minimizers and how you select, uh, subsample these cameras. Uh, and with that, I think that is about it. So the slides left intentionally blank, but hopefully you guys don't all have blank minds and have lots of questions to ask me. Thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. And I'm sure um, all our audience will agree with that. And also I'm just so impressed with you like sketch noting as you're speaking, like just incredible. Thank you so much. Um, we have our first question, which is our question for the for the season, essentially, so Rohan can continue his list of books to read. Um, do you have any books you'd recommend? Ah, yes. So uh, let's see. So I actually really like, um, there's a book by Jelani Nelson on sketching. Uh, I pulled it up. Let me see if I can find the link and drop it in chat. So uh, th there's this really cool book by Jelani Nelson, who is amazing. If you haven't heard him speak, uh, he's just amazing. But anyway, so he is he is one of the uh, experts in uh, uh, sketching algorithms. And so the sort of idea of you making use of random hash functions to shape data in a particular way so that you can do much faster queries on it. Um, and I, I think this is super duper cool stuff. Um, so that's probably what I'd recommend. Uh, a lot of the more recent stuff like on minimizers and stuff like that, I don't think there are textbooks that have like sort of cover that because this is still a very ongoing field. I, I noticed that there's another question about how bioinformatics algorithms have been solved. They have not been solved. There's still so much there. Like, um, and also just because we're constantly getting new types of data. Um, so like, like in other fields, like we're constantly getting new and more sources of data. And so we need to develop the algorithms to handle it as well. Fantastic. And I really like that it's a book that is available in PDF. No gatekeeping or anything. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, excellent. So we'll stop recording now. And I haven't seen any questions on the chat yet, um, which means that you probably just explained everything perfectly clearly. Um, no, but if, any <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has any much. questions, <laughs> please raise your hands, type in the chat. Um, we'll call on you. 